I'd like to thank Carson Brown for being here and bringing a message to us from a teeny tiny book in the Bible, Bible Titus, that we almost forget is there. So hold on. Um, I'd like to welcome you, whether you're here in person or whether you're online. Thanks for joining in with us today. I'd like to also draw your attention to the welcome cards that are in your pews if you're here in the sanctuary. If you'd like to leave us a note, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to, to grab one of those little cards and fill it out. And the friendship pads are at the end of each pew. If you'll sign your name and pass it on, then we'll know who else here, and you can leave us a question there too. Um, there are birthdays and anniversaries in the bulletin, and you might want to uh, look and see who's here today and wish them happy birthday or happy anniversary. Adult education today is going to be at 11 o'clock up, uh, upstairs on the elevator side of the building, facilitated by Ken Junkins. I um, also want to make you aware that Presbyterian Women will be on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And um, that's going to be in room 209, and the speaker is from Mission Haven in Decatur, Georgia, where Presbyterian missionaries live while they're here on, on furlough in the United States. Did you even know that we still have Presbyterian missionaries? And now I'd like to ask Adrian Hendricks, our youth director, to come up and share some information. of you have probably heard and seen, we are doing VBS um, the week of Memorial Day, Tuesday through Friday. So I am looking for volunteers. I need lots and lots of help. Um, we are going to be having, it's a camp theme, and it's going to be lots of fun. I've been going through it, and it looks really, really enjoyable. So um, if you would like to volunteer, I will be in the narthex after service. You can come see me and let me know. I tried to have a sign-up sheet today, but alas, I had uh, printer issues. So I will try to have that in the narthex before next Sunday, but you can come see me and let me know, and I'll take your name and information down. Um, so just uh, let me know. And um, also, quick plug, uh, there's youth group tonight, and I don't have anybody on the schedule to cook dinner. So if you would like to do that, please also see me. That would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much.
please join me in the responsive call to worship. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He knows us and we belong to him. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He speaks and we listen for his voice. Let's quiet our minds now for the opening prayer. We are your people, O oh God, the sheep of your pasture, the flock you have gathered. Lead us beside still waters. Teach us the way of righteousness and feed us at your table. Through Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. Amen. And now if you'd like to stand and join in, we're going to sing hymn number 394, Christ has made our sure foundation.
attitude of prayer with me. Let us pray. Worthy is your name, O gracious and wonderful God, King and Lord of the Most High. As we gather in this place, as one body, a representative of the many congregations worshiping all around our world this day, we each come with different emotions. Some of us bring anxiety, some of us bring frustration, some bring joy, some bring jubilance. But we each come with a sense of longing, longing for something deep in our lives, something meaningful, something that will grant us ultimate joy and sustain us for all eternity. And we come to this place knowing we have found that in you. Turn our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and our ears to worshiping you this day, that we may be attentive to the needs of one another in our midst. We consider all of these requests this morning. And in particular, we think of those who are known in our hearts, who we treasure in our minds, who are in need. And as we stand before you humbly today, we give thanks for the many ways that you are at work in our lives. God, you know our hearts. You know our needs and our longings and our deepest, most personal desires. Be with us these days as we submit these things to you with gratitude for what you have done in our lives and what you will do in the time to come. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples, all of us, to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the time has come to bring forth our tithes and our offerings as the plates are being passed this morning. I invite you to consider the ways that God has blessed you and the ways that you can bless your church community and your neighbors through the receiving of these gifts. Let us bring them forward this morning. Thank you. 
at you. Gracious God, receive these gifts, these tithes and these offerings, that as we have brought them forward, you may use them to bless the multitudes, just as you did through the original giver, Jesus Christ. It is in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to consider these words as a poetic invitation as we prepare to hear the word of God today from Psalm 80. Listen for these words. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned in the heavens, shine forth. Stir up your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. But you restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Let us join together in our hymn of preparation, number 800, Sometimes a Light Surprises. Would you stand and join? Well, let me tell you 
What a joy it is to be here with you today. This is my second time here at Pine Shores. My first was when I had the ultimate and distinct pleasure of attending a very special service last year in my capacity as the moderator of the Presbytery as we celebrated the retirement of Bruce and Karen Wismer. And what an exciting time that was. It was wonderful to see such a full sanctuary with people who were so committed to celebrating not just two faithful servants who have served this church so well, but to celebrate where this church is going in the future. What a joy it is to be able to do that with you today. It is true, though, that I did get a sense of the Pine Shores spirit long before that, when about five or six years ago, I was subjected to being forced to serve on a committee with Gene George. And let me tell you, um, I learned a thing or two about this church and its people then, and I can assure you they were nothing but incredibly positive. So thank you for having me today. I'd like to give you a bit of background for our text that we're going to be talking about today. I appreciate that Susan mentioned this because it is so true. How many of us could find Titus in the Bible? They used to have those competitions for kids to flip through the Bibles to try and see who could find the book the fastest. And I tried to do that with Titus just this morning, and it took me about five minutes. Uh, because it only takes up, if you notice in your pew Bibles, it only takes up one sheet of paper, just two pages, and it barely covers the whole thing there. It is nestled in a little quiet corner of the Bible, amongst the backdrop of other epistles right after we finish 2 Timothy. It's widely considered that 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are kind of like a trifecta, if you will. Paul's specific epistles intentionally written for disciples of Christ, but also followers of Paul who were trying to learn a little bit more about what it meant to be a good evangelist to the Gentiles and the Jews alike. So let's consider these words this morning and think about them in the context of what's happening in our lives today. Shall we do that? Let's read from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety, there's a big word, and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own, who are zealous for good deeds. Declare these things, exhort and reprove with all authority, let no one look down on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. So what do we know about this man, Titus? We know a couple of things. We know that he was a Gentile. We know that he led churches on Crete, a Gentile territory. And what we see in these few verses that are squared right there in the middle of his letter are a bit of encouragement, classic Pauline encouragement. You may have noticed some parallels in other verses. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.12 is a major verse that I think about all the time. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in love, speech, purity, etc., etc. And you notice that here, too. Don't let anyone look down upon you. Don't let anyone disregard you. And this is particularly important because what we know about the early church is that in the early church, there were all sorts of factions, all sorts of people who were arguing and advocating for different things, trying to make claims about what Christ did or did not say, getting a lot of people to join in on that. 
Therefore, we saw all sorts of Christian leaders, like Titus, like Timothy, like others, looking for the type of guidance and advice that would practically serve them in their unique ministry context to foster a sense of reconciliation, to bring the church together as one, to grant a spirit and a sense of unity. So let's walk through this a little bit and think about what we know about what we're hearing this morning. First, we hear at the very beginning talk about the appearance. The appearance of grace is the phrase that is used. The appearance of grace, which I love. Obviously, this is a reference to Jesus Christ and his appearance on earth. John talks about this. The very beginning of John in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, the grace that Jesus Christ brought was responsible for bringing salvation for all people. Now, Titus is important because it marks a bit of a turning point in the scriptures, because previously, talk of salvation was primarily focused on Jews as God's chosen people. But with the coming of Jesus, the message of salvation was spreading to both Jews and Gentiles. This wording is just so fascinating to me. It appeared like, poof, abracadabra, there it is. This comes from a Greek word that means to shine upon or to have proof of. It's like you shine a flashlight on something and boom, there it is, exactly what you're looking for. It's as though you're stumbling around in the dark and suddenly it appears. It's really the story of the Bible, isn't it? People wandering around in the dark for thousands of years, they have clues about what they're looking for, but they don't know exactly what it is, and then suddenly, the light of Christ shines brightly, and the grace that's needed for all humankind appears. Something tangible to associate with what we need to live. God's grace was shined upon us through Jesus. You'll also notice that that language of appeared sounds very incarnational, doesn't it? Doesn't it a big word that basically means how Christ came to be through Mary? Christ just was the way that Christ came to earth, which of course is what separates Christianity from every other religion that has ever been. We have major religions in this world, certainly. We have Judaism, we have Islam, we have Hinduism, we have Buddhism, but we have a lot of small religions too. We have a lot of tribal religions, a lot of indigenous religions, thousands and thousands and thousands, and a lot of them have similarities. If you made a gigantic uh, Venn diagram, you would see a lot of space in those middle sections. But the one thing about Christianity that separates it from the rest is that it's the only religion that we know of that posits that a God, a deity, that was above and the creator of the people would come down and become one of the people in order to live among them and take on their burdens. Other religions talk about a God who is saving the people from high above, but not Christianity. Ours is an extremely personal religion, one in which God knew our struggle so much that he became one of us so that he could feel it too. That's the type of love that our God has for us. And that's what our text describes when it talks about appearing this incarnational language. And this is also an incarnational book, Titus. Titus was, was one of the primary New Testament epistles that focused on this idea of Jesus Christ just appearing, which is important. It's important to remember that the understandings that we have now about different things in the Gospels, about the death and resurrection of Christ, are things that the early church did not understand. It took a long time, and for the canonical Bible, to be put together for people in churches to really be able to piece together and understand exactly what the Bible was saying about this man, Jesus Christ. 
And the Incarnation was something that a lot of people struggled with, this idea of a virgin birth that Jesus suddenly appeared, especially in the early church when people were so focused on his death and resurrection, that they didn't think a lot about from whence he came. So this is important. But the other thing that's important in this text is some of the language that we get to in later verses. The verses that talk about how God's grace is involved in teaching us to turn away from certain things. Worldly, unrestrained, godless behaviors. The Greek in these verses uses two words with similar meanings. One is translated as ungodliness or godlessness, and the other as worldly passions or worldly lusts. Now, ungodliness is simply anything that contradicts God's will or his nature. God's grace helps believers in Christ to reject ungodly living. It also helps us to reject sinful desires, which is particularly important. We need this type of endurance training that God's grace offers us in order to avoid the behaviors that are naturally sinful within us. The second major point in this verse, in verse 12, talks about living with self-control. Self-control, kind of an interesting fruit of the Spirit. Isn't it? What exactly is self-control? Now, self-control is mentioned frequently by Paul in this letter to Titus, in essence emphasizing what we'll call the importance of a discipled life. And that's one of the central questions that I'd like to explore with you today. What does it mean to live a discipled life? Because coming to church every Sunday and participating in every different class you can and reading your Bible every day and praying every day are all positive attributes. Yes. But there's something deeper about the heart of discipleship that makes us into the types of disciples that Christ has called us to be. Now, what's important to know about the context here is that many of the people in Titus' audience in Crete were extremely, well, according to the Greek, lazy. Lazy, self-focused is another word that the Greek uses to translate. A uh, very apt description of most societies at large, really. But on this particular place, in this particular island, apparently the island lifestyle had taken over to a point where it was just too much to bear. They were laying on hammocks all day and sipping Mai Tais and not doing anything productive, it seems. The Greek, dikaios, is the word, and it's translated as righteously or upright, as in what kind of discipled, disciplined life do you want to be living? A righteous or upright life. Those words literally mean proper or right. Godly, in this context, is the polar opposite of ungodly, mentioned earlier in the verse. What's interesting to me about this is that verse 11, our first verse that we read, began a discussion on the grace of God, which continues through the end of this chapter. The next verse refers to believers looking forward to a blessed hope. This hope, of course, being the appearance of there's that word again, of Jesus Christ. New Testament mentions various appearings of Christ, appearing on earth as a human and appearing alive to the disciples after his resurrection. We've been thinking a lot about that, Jesus' post-Easter activity, haven't we, since we are moving into the weeks of Easter tide, right after Easter Sunday, where we consider what exactly it was that Jesus did with his spare time after coming back from the dead. But there's another appearing, too, one that coincides directly with the idea of a discipled life. This verse mentions it, as well as in 1 Timothy, we see more similarities there. The future event in question is referred to as the blessed hope, a phrase that the New Testament only uses once. 
right here in this context. This appearing will be of the glory, indicating the coming of Jesus in power. Jesus is called our great God, which is a reminder that we are each united in him. Paul, Timothy, Titus, no apostle or disciple is greater than another, for we are all servants of Christ. Jesus is also called Savior, Redeemer, Christ. The term Christ, of course, being from the Greek word Christos, translated from the Hebrew for Messiah. So why would this be emphasized so many times in this short package of verses? Well, I believe that the message that Paul is trying to send us here is that one cannot happen without the other. The appearing of our blessed hope, of our eternal power in Christ's glory, cannot happen without a discipled life. If you really read this text intentionally, it's positioned like a cause and effect. You live a discipled life, and that leads to the unlocking of our blessed hope. So let's explore exactly what an upright life means. That's the one word that I've really been thinking about. Different translations use different words. The translation we read used the word upright. What is an upright life? There's a book that's been making the rounds recently by a guy named Jordan Peterson called 12 Rules for Life. It was a number one bestseller for, for months and months and months, and it's still one of the top selling books on Amazon very popular. I know a church uh, who has a men's group that's studying it, and it has, as the title might suggest, 12 different rules for how to live a good, positive, fruitful life that will grant you a sense of purpose and fulfillment and contentment. And the rules go all over the board. There are rules that talk about uh, living a life where you find a sense of purpose in your family, from all from that to things that talk about the need for exercise, etc., etc. But his first rule, his very first one, is to have a straight posture. Keep up a good, straight posture. Writes a whole chapter about it. That is his first rule, the rule that sets the tone for the rest. And he speaks in there about both the psychological and physical benefits of standing up straight. It can do a lot for you, not just in how you present yourself to the world, but what it does in your own mind. Posture is incredibly important, not just physically, but spiritually as well. What does it mean to have a good, solid, spiritual posture? When we think about the term upright, you may notice that root word up. Those two letters, the word up. Well, what does the word up mean? We think of it mostly in a binary context. We have up and we have down. There's not really any middle. You either are going up or you're either going down. The elevator doesn't stop. It either goes up or it goes down. And what's interesting about up and down being so binary is that when we get to the back of the Bible, we get to books like Titus, we get to books like 1 John, Belief in Christ is presented as something binary. You either believe or you don't. First John talks about you either have the advocate of Christ or the antichrist, which is defined as everything that takes your attention away from Christ or imitates Christ. You either have one or the other. Now, in a society where false gods were still quite popular, Paul and other authors found it quite prudent to lay out the stakes very clearly. You can't have multiple things competing for your attention if you are to live a truly discipled life. You only have two choices. To believe or not. To live righteously or not. To live an upright life or not. It's very difficult to live a life that's sort of upright, just like it's very difficult to only sort of be going up in an elevator or on a staircase. 
It doesn't really work that way. You're either traveling in one direction or you're traveling in another. And I think we have this binary reality in our society. As I mentioned a minute ago, I think this is a particularly poignant text for a couple weeks after Easter, because what happens after Easter? We finish the ham, we take off the Easter bonnets and save them for next year, and we start to put away in the closet our decorations for springtime. But we also put away in our spiritual closet the decorations of our hearts that we wear so proudly during Easter. Just like during Advent, when we try to present ourselves as pious, holy people, we attend all the book studies, we come to all the special services. We're here on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. You're here three out of four days. Wow, that's a lot. And we try to present ourselves as though we're doing everything we can to be the best versions of Christians that we need to be. But then right after Easter is over, it all seems to poof, just disappear. And I wonder sometimes why that is. I wonder why it feels so rote and routine for us, not just to get into the spirit of Christmas and Easter, but to push them away as well. And I think it's because we have difficulty with this idea of the binary reality. We are either living upright lives or we're not. It feels hard to live an upright life consistently, so we almost kind of feel like after Easter, we get a break. We don't have to do all the churchy stuff. We can just focus on whatever else is going on in our lives. You know what's interesting? I think a lot of us look at our faith like an elevator, using this up and down metaphor for just another minute or two. We have this idea that we get into an elevator and we press the button and it takes us to the top floor. God powers the elevator. It's your belief in Jesus Christ that opens the door and presses the button for you and sends you up to the top floor, not just of a life on earth, but for all eternity. And the truth is, this isn't really how it works. Life is a lot more like a staircase in this regard. As in, you have to do the work of moving up the stairs. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying the Catholic belief that faith and works, good works mixed together, equal salvation. Your salvation is guaranteed in Christ alone. That gets you to the top floor automatically. I'm talking about what happens in this life. Because belief in God doesn't automatically take us to the top floor believing we're a good person. Or believing that we are more pious or better than anyone else. Just because you believe and you sit in a pew doesn't mean that you're better than anyone. And I don't think most of us actually believe that explicitly. But I think sometimes it can be easy to let that reality kind of come into our minds. We associate Judeo-Christian values, the idea of coming to church every Sunday, leading an a outwardly religious life as being a good thing in our society that's regarded as uh, ethically sound, morally conscious, and we see a lot of people and institutions in our society that seem to be going down the slope of morality and ethics. And so at the same time, we kind of have this reality in our minds that clicks that just subliminally makes us think, well, we're doing something right and everyone else is doing something wrong. That's an elevator mentality. The truth is, if we truly want to live an upright, discipled life, we have to climb the stairs, which means putting in effort, not just during Holy Week, not just during Advent, but throughout the whole year. You may remember Genesis 28, the dream of Jacob, the stairway to heaven, the gospel according to Zeppelin, as I believe it was known at one point. And what happens on this incline to glory? It's heavily trafficked, for one. All of God's angels move up and down the stairway, which means they too, in this story, are seeking to climb 
to a life of discipleship. But the latter represents a physical, tangible connection between God and people, a way that God in the heavens could access the people down below. Now, the dream alludes to this, but that latter is eventually and ultimately replaced by Christ. Christ becomes our outlet to access God. And so, of course, it's poignant to recall the fact that Christ talks almost incessantly about leading an upright life. There's a movie called Up. You may have seen it. Very popular Disney movie, 2009, won the Academy Award for Best um, Screenplay, best, best Animated Film. And in the movie, there is an older gentleman who seeks to escape his life, doesn't like it very much, so he strings on as many balloons as he can find to his house and lifts up into the sky and pilots his house all the way to the jungles of South America where he hopes to find true contentment and peace. And he lands there and finds neither. In fact, he finds that the troubles that he had at home followed him and he had new troubles that he didn't even know he was going to have, that he didn't even expect. And that's how life works sometimes, doesn't it? I hate to spoil the movie for you, but you've had about 15 years to see it. It ends with Carl realizing that if he goes back to where he was and tries to build a life there, his true happiness will come. Because you have to build it. You can't just wait for it to happen. You can't just climb into an elevator and expect it to make you a better person just because you've made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ. It requires work and effort. And I know that that is difficult. Peer pressure. We use that term when we talk to middle schoolers, right? But how applicable is it for us, too? The pressures of a world that is constantly telling us to do everything other than live an upright life. A life filled with temptations that awaits us. Have you ever been in a casino before? This world is a lot like that. Casinos that don't have clocks, don't have windows, and intentionally pump air into the room that makes you want to stay there and do everything in your power to keep you playing the game. It's kind of what our world is like. Every single thing outside of this place is competing for your attention, trying to do everything it can to drag you back down the stairs, to stop you, to wear you down. The old book, Pilgrim's Progress, that talks about Christian, the pilgrim, carrying a giant burden on his back of the things that he's experiencing in his life that the enemy in the world are telling him are too big to bear and will prevent him from ascending the staircase. I'll close by sharing an illustration with you. I was thinking a lot about this recently. You might remember one of the biggest news stories of last year was the Titan submersible. You remember this? A crew of people went down to the depths of the bottom of the ocean to try and find the Titanic, the remnants they were going to go explore. And the submersible disappeared. And no one knew what happened to it. They had lost radio communication. It took them a few days to figure out what had happened. And they eventually realized that it had imploded. Not exploded. Not just compacted, it had imploded. Because the pressure of what was outside of it and what was around it became too much to bear that at the ultimate point of criticality, it all came in. And if we're not careful, that's what the world does to us. The Bible tells us that our enemy is like a prowling lion, waiting and lying for the perfect opportunity to strike. And that's exactly what happens. In this world, we see all sorts of 
of opportunities to distract us from climbing the staircase, to distract us from being good, discipled children. And every single time that we let our guard down, we inch closer to that point of criticality where all the pressure comes in. Now, of course, we have a stronger submersible in Christ. And the good news about all of this is, on those days where you fall down the staircase, even if you fall all the way back down to the bottom and you have to get right back up again and start walking, Christ walks alongside you. You never walk alone. There are some times in your life that Christ will just pick you up and put you on his back and carry you where you need to go. But we have to put in the effort, too. We have to be willing and able. And if we can do that, if we can climb the staircase and not just think that we are on an elevator, then maybe, just maybe, Easter and the weeks after it will mean something different entirely to us next year every year after. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join with me in our affirmation of faith, which is an excerpt from a 1997 declaration of faith. Let us consider and say together these incredibly poignant words. We know our efforts cannot bring in God's kingdom, but hope plunges us into the struggle for victories over evil that are possible now in the world, the church, and our individual lives. Hope gives us courage and energy to contend against all opposition, however invincible it may seem, for the new world and the new humanity that are surely coming. Jesus is Lord. He has been Lord from the beginning. He will be Lord at the end. Even now, he is Lord. Amen. My friends, would you stand and join me in our closing hymn number 360, Christ is Coming. Let's sing.
I would like to say a word of thanks for allowing me to be here with you today. It has been such a joy and such a privilege. I want to thank the choir, especially because you had to look at the back of my head, which is definitely the least attractive part of it. Um, so I thank you for that. Uh, I will make a quick confession to you, and that is at my church back home, right back there where that television is, they have a big red clock with the time. And that's a way of telling you, hurry up and get going. So if you saw me looking at my watch, I'm just trying to be faithful to that. My friends, I encourage you to consider what it means to live an upright life. Let that word, that adjective ring in your mind all day, all week. I don't know exactly what it means for you specifically, because it does mean something different for everyone. But I do know this. With Christ, through Christ, in Christ, it is indeed possible. Now may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And may all God's children say together, Amen. Amen.